I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 225, The Lecture. This is the second instalment in the vlogs that I'm preparing for Olivia. Hello Olivia. Last week we introduced how to be a lecturer, how to move from more casualised work to a contract lectureship position. That's fantastic. And next week we're exploring the impact of digitisation. On the lecture but this week I thought it was the important moment to focus very strongly on the lecture itself so today is much more of an operational vlog if you're about to lecture how do you make a lecture work and it is a very very tough genre or oeuvre of public speaking it's a very tough genre or oeuvre of teaching and learning. And as a casual academic, you spend a lot of your time tutoring, demonstrating, you do a lot of marking, don't we? We do a lot of marking, but you do the occasional lecture. But the lecture is very, very special. It is a beautiful thing because it is a space for summoning ideas. It is a space for weaving knowledge. It has a remarkable and a distinguished history and it's currently on the skids. So today I want to talk about the lecture, this remarkable mode of communication with a great history, with a great heritage in academic life, that maybe just as the lecture is declining, we just need a little bit of a reminder that it was valuable and it still has. A lot of value and then I'm going to talk about how to deliver a powerful lecture so the operational component now through my entire career you know decades long now in academic life I've been told a whole series of mantras the lecture is dying the lecture is boring the lecture doesn't work lectures are bad that's happened my entire academic career, lectures, oh, lectures are over. They've been over a long time. And of course, the reason that nonsense exists is because actually those mantras are ridiculous. They're wrong, they're pointless, and they're actually pretty offensive. Because there's no such thing as a bad lecture. There are only bad lecturers. Yeah. So let's talk about the lecture and let's talk about its incredibly distinguished heritage. And the lecture dates back to the 14th century. The word comes from the Latin lectus, lectus, which means, and this is really interesting, to read, to read. We'll come back to that in a second. So the lecture is an oral presentation of information. And that information is presented to an audience. To this day and through it, all of its history, it has been associated with the university. And if you think about it, other sorts of presentations use other weird adjectives and nouns. So a politician's speech, a minister's sermon, or a businessman's sales presentation. So as you can see, oral communication, but different phrases are deployed. So beyond the teaching function in a university, a lecture also has a public role, a public function, particularly in the sciences and particularly in social activist movements. Lectures are defined in information literacy as a type or a mode of grey literature. I think that's important when you're thinking about your own research, about the status of a lecture as a research artefact, so the grey literature. So yes, lectures are attacked, but they've been in existence since at least the medieval university where notes were taken from the reading of original material. So a lecturer would read original material and students would take, you've guessed it, notes. So as you can see from this very early history, note taking from students was part of the lecture. Now, wh why do the lectures get such bad press? A lot of reasons for that. The arguments are, and I'll rehearse them for you, that a lecture places students in a passive position. 
it's a one-way mode of communication. Good luck with that. And also, it is incredibly demanding on the lecturer. Certainly true. But through all those critiques, all those mantras, the lecture remains the foundation of our universities, the foundation of teaching and learning. And there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of really famous lectures, many which have been captured and are on YouTube to this day. And I'd particularly love to draw you to the history of the world in 46 lectures that were delivered by Columbia University, and that's available from openculture.org. Fantastic. And of course, TED Talks continue this tradition, and we'll talk a lot about TED Talks next week. And what I'm going to do in next week's vlog is discuss pretty robustly the impact of digitization on the lecture for good and ill, and also the new options that are available to us. Today, though, is a little bit different. I want to look at the lecture. And lecturing well <laughs> is incredibly difficult because it is, yes, public speaking, but with a very specific focus or force, and that is to create a learning environment. Wow. So we're going to talk about the lectures operationally now, how to make your lectures under outstanding, amazing. And I want to give you 10 strategies for your consideration to improve your engagement with the lecture, whether as a lecturer or someone who listens to them. This is a very, very special space and genre. It is precious. So let's recognize it while it still exists. One, how to do a good lecture? Organization is everything. Organization is everything. Lectures are organized. They're not riffing off a few headings. They're not reading PowerPoint slides. They are incredibly well structured. They have a title, they have a purpose, they have a structure, and they have propulsion. My mantra has always been, and I've applied this throughout my entire scholarly career, the more complex the content in a lecture, the simpler the structure. So the more complex content that you're conveying, the simpler the structure you will need. And for decades, I've structured lectures in four sections. I can hear all my former students laugh because I used to say, this lecture is structured in how many sections? To which everybody would yell, four. So I famously structure lectures in four sections, nice and simple. And often the first section is definitional to provide a gateway into the knowledge system. The second section is historical. The third section frames the scholarly debates in this area, and the fourth section often goes to the future, arches to the future. Very simple structure, thanks for playing. That's a bit reified, I've moved it about a lot, but you get the drift. Students from the start of the lecture, therefore, know where it will end, and that's incredibly important because they gain confidence. All oh, right, this is where we're starting, this is our journey, this is where it's ending, cool, and that means they've got confidence in you. You're their tour guide through knowledge in a lecture. So take them by the hand and guide them through. And they gain confidence, students, through the clear, clean, and precise exploration of ideas. Two, this is the powerful one for me. Lectures enable differentiated learning. A book or an article doesn't talk back. A recorded lecture can't moderate its level dependent on student needs. But a live lecture is responsive. We can make corrections in real time. So a lecturer can read the room, change some content, shift or alter the level and offer deeper interpretations or indeed alternative definitions. So when I write a curriculum, I always present a diversity of readings each week. And I do it structurally. Again, very simple structure. I often present five readings 
for the students each week. The first one is very, very straightforward, a gateway into the topic. So if students are struggling, and a lot of students do, they always know there's going to be one straightforward reading that they can hold on to and they can sort of get it a bit, right? But then I also, out of those five articles, present one stretch reading, one really, really tough piece of work for the students doing well, wanting more, having a fantastic time, so they know there's going to be a really, really tough reading there to really enable their thinking. Great. And of course, in between, you know, it's graded very carefully. So all sorts of students find a way into the topic. And of course, lectures are the same. We write lectures for multiple abilities. And because they are analog, and because they are synchronous, we can alter and shift and shape that content in real time. For the student needs. So we talk a lot these days about differentiated learning and we critique the deficit model of teaching and learning quite rightly. But lectures are the place for differentiated learning by enabling standards without standardisation. Three, read widely for lectures. Lectures are dreadful when lecturers haven't read enough. This I think is at its worst when a lecturer has a textbook and they read the textbook and take versions of that textbook and construct lectures from it. Wow, dreadful. Remember what a textbook does is it presents one view. What a lecture needs to do is present plurality a diversity of views, and yes, synthesize them and interpret them, but always hold on to the diversity of approaches and perspectives. So instead of a singular view, the great thing about a lecture is you can use all sorts of materials, grey literature certainly, material from professional organisations, academic papers with a strong stream of argument, you can use news. You can also use popular culture. This diversity is so powerful because what you're able to do in a lecture is both capture and manage a diversity of views, ideas, theories and perspectives. How fantastic is that? You're going to have a much more complex and intricate understanding of a topic if you read widely for it. Because what you've got to do is go with it. Go with the conflict. Go with the difference in ideas. That's great. You've then got to be able to control it and present it in a way that is organised. So when you find adversarial approaches to a topic, whether it be palliative care or the pet shop boys, go with the conflict. Go with the differing interpretations. Get into that debate and present that to students because what you're modelling for students is the management of difference, understanding the diversity of approaches in knowledge and in disciplines, respecting that diversity and finding a way through it. A lecture models that for students and future researchers. Four, cite your references. Is there anything worse? than someone reading off PowerPoint slides and pretending they are lecturing. Those of you that have seen me lecture outside of these sort of fora know that actually I don't, a whole series of talks I do, I don't use PowerPoint at all, but when I write a lecture, I write a lecture as text in its entirety first. And only once the lecture is finished do I then construct visual aids of which PowerPoint is the clear example, right? So after I've got the content and I'm cool with it, then I do the PowerPoint. And I use PowerPoint, yes, to present that skeleton of a lecture. So this lecture has four parts and those four parts are listed on a PowerPoint slide. So the structure is there. But most importantly, I use PowerPoint as a visual wash. It is a truth of lecturing that you must never, ever, ever say what is on a PowerPoint slide. Your audience can read. Let them read. But instead, I use PowerPoint as a visual accompaniment to my sonic oral, oral 
presentation. So I use photographs, graphs, charts, and I also display my references. And this is quite important, I think. So I put book covers up, I put articles up, I scan them up and I put them on a PowerPoint slide so that students, particularly first years, can start to see how to cite. So they can see a great scholar's work. They learn how to spell the name and they can see the scholarly landscape. Very, very important. And that models behaviour for them. That I'm not just randomly inventing stuff on any given day. Oh, let's just talk about something. It's like, no, lectures are knowledge and we read a great deal. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we enable ideas through the hard yakka of scholars in the past. So I use PowerPoint to show those references, show the scholars. And that means that students start to see that sources can be tracked. They need to model and manage their source material and they need to cite their sources. And I think most importantly, it reminds students that even in teaching and learning, research and scholarship is part of it. As you've heard me say so often, the whole point of being an academic is we teach and research and the research goes into the teaching and the teaching goes into the research. Five, introductions and conclusions matter. I've always started lectures with a story, a professional opening if you will, and it welcomes students to the space. But also, I think I present a story so it signals the arc of scholarship. So don't waste the first couple of minutes of a lecture with housekeeping. It's one of my crazy things. You know, people go, oh, look, we'll just start with some housekeeping. No, really don't. No, really, really don't. You can do that as a notification on an online forum. You, you don't need that. The lecture time, every second in a lecture is precious. Don't waste it with housekeeping. Don't waste it on trivialities. Start with a bang. You are taking students on a journey. Similarly, learn how to time your lectures properly. This is big. And make the last minute really count. You've got to time it properly and make sure that last minute nails the argument home. So confirm the big idea, the take home message from that lecture, finish on a high, finish with something memorable. And remember that timing is everything. I do, as you know, I write lectures and I time them. So I know exactly within about 45 seconds how long a lecture is going to take to deliver. So time it accurately and know that the content can fill the available slot on the timetable. Six. Preparation is the only way to manage anxiety. Now, as we've talked about in so many other vlogs, public speaking is one of the great fears that most people have. And look, academic lectures are really, really tough. They're the toughest example of public speaking because they are content heavy. And if you don't know your stuff, you're going to be found out. No pressure there. Okay, so I work incredibly hard during a lecture and just to give you the scope and scale of it, when I finish a 45-50 minute lecture, my dress is wet. I am absolutely soaked. I'm absolutely shattered. I'm so shattered that I frequently can't remember walking back to my office and when I used to do late lectures, what they call twilight lectures in the United Kingdom, 4 to 6 p.m., I couldn't remember walking to the train and I can't remember the train trip home, right? So that shows you the sense of the physicality in lectures. They are intentionally demanding because they require more physical, intellectual concentration than just about any act in life. And that's why, of course, you have to read widely. You have to structure your ideas carefully. Practice, 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 practice. And I think one of the reasons I've managed this vlog series, and you know, we've been going for four and a half years without a break, we've never missed a week. I think one of the reasons we've been able to do this as a family is because I lectured 
for decades. I taught first years for decades. So I'm used to the cycle of reading widely, synthesizing, organizing ideas in an interesting shape, and then learning the lectures. And I spend hours each week in simply memory work. So I learn lectures. Every word that I say in a lecture is on these cards, right? And so I've learned the technique by managing lectures that I use in these vlogs to this day. So preparation is the way to manage the fear, manage the panic, manage the stress. Preparation, practice. Not hard. Preparation, practice. Now I go through lectures as I go through these vlogs about 50 or 100 times before I deliver them. And that means, and it's very useful for me, so I go through it intensely. And that preparation actually saves me time. It reduces my stress, and hopefully it always demonstrates to you that I have respect for you, and I have respect for your time. Seven. Eye contact is everything. <laughs> uh, when you're frightened, when you're nervous and you're speaking in public, and you see people do this all the time, you don't look at people. You know, you sort of look at the wall, or you look at, look behind the audience, or you look sort of there, or you look down here, or you just read your PowerPoint slides, or you keep your head down. The last thing you do is actually look, eyeball people in the audience. But you need to look into the eyes of your students. Because if you can break that fourth wall, and I wander about, most of you that have seen me when I lecture, I don't stay behind a lectern at all, I wander about. And because you have that movement, you can engage with students, you can eyeball them, you can have a conversation. Because remember, a lecture is a communication system. Let me just state that again. A lecture is a communication system. So if you have that connection with students, if you smile, you communicate then you learn to read a room and work out if your level is accurate. And when a lecture becomes a communication system, you can see and understand the multiple literacies that exist in any lecture room and create an open space where people can ask questions or email you later and admit to you in a comfortable way, look, I really didn't get that. Can you give it to me again in a different way? So look at your students in the eye. Smile, communicate. Lecturing is an embodied act and the connection commences when you have the courage to lift your head and summon your gaze. Eight. <laughs> you can never speak too slowly. <laughs> Now, when you're nervous or passionate or excited or just fabulous, um, we all have a tendency to increase the speed of our delivery. I do it as well. And while altering the speed of a delivery can be incredibly exciting and certainly convey that excitement, the best lecture delivery is actually slow. Certainly you have moderations in speed and tone and modality. But the best way to learn how to moderate your pitch and your timing is to practice by recording yourself. Now I understand the video recording is very confronting, you don't have to do that, but even just recording it on your phone, recording it sonically. Listen to the pattern and how you communicate. How do you express your ideas? And all of us have tips and tricks and weird things that we do, and I have lots of them, okay? And that's cool. That's the diversity of who we are as humans. That's brilliant. And that individuality, encourage that. That's fine. That's great. That's fabulous. As long as it probably doesn't distract too much from the story that you're trying to convey. And it is important that you cultivate an individual style. That's important. Do do that. But be reflexive about your voice and train your voice. What we've got to do is we've got, what a lecturer does, is we've got to connect our body with our voice. Now I know that sounds really weird, but voices are embodied. Voices come from our bodies our voice comes through our bodies. And lecturers create very special, very innovative relationships between voices and bodies. 
Lectures are analog, they're hot, they're sweaty, they're multi-sensory. And isn't that fabulous? Digital lectures flatten the experience. So when you are a digital lecturer, you have to learn to manage the interface of a screen. And that's a whole series of different techniques. But I've always argued that lectures at their very best are embodied. So work on building those pathways between your body and your voice. Nine, show emotion, show emotion. Now, if you're just delivering content, let your students read it, it's faster. What makes a lecture magical is it's also an emotional experience. By that, I mean you are embodying knowledge. You are a storyteller of scholarship. You can emphasize stress, focus, but also motivate. The legendary Adrian Rich, we are not worthy, what a scholar. The legendary Adrian Rich stated that the moment that feeling enters the body is political, end of quote. Wow. <laughs> so why lectures are extraordinary is that they create an environment around ideas and they create excitement around ideas. Because you, you can talk about not only what is important, and that's important, what's important, and you can talk about that, but you can talk about why it's important. The passion for ideas is contagious. And it's the single reason, to be frank, through all this nonsense, that I still believe in lectures. Learning requires motivation. And if you're having difficulty ensuring that your students are reading widely, that they're writing effectively, or they're understanding why are they doing this experiment, then you provide that context to the content. That's what a lecture does. It provides the meaning around the knowledge. You can show emotion. You can show passion. And that's what a lecture can do. Ten. Everything is about the students. We can talk about content, we can talk about organisation, PowerPoint, I can talk about voices and bodies and stuff. But everything is actually about the students. Everything. If I teach and students don't learn, then I haven't taught. And I know that's controversial. Whenever I say that, I often get a lot of attacks. But to be frank with you, I want students to learn. And the whole reason I'm here is that so students learn. And if I fail doing that, then I'm not a very good teacher because I'm in charge of a lot of things, but one of the things I'm in charge of is motivation. Now, I know there are a stack of students that go to university these days and have no idea why they're there, right? They're sort of there and they don't really know what they're doing and they're not too bothered, and I get that. But if we're lucky, then the whole point of a great lecturer is we can give them that motivation. We can provide that context to the content and they can work out why they're at university. I always remember it was Alexandra Trayford who stated that, quote, the best teachers are those that show you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. You see, lectures are fabulous. Lectures are extraordinary. They offer a pathway, a vista, a vision. Most importantly, they provide the foundations for motivation. Students, through good lecturing, can see a version of their future selves and also know how to get there. I wish you love, light 
and peace. Tia. <laughs>